Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking some time to be on with us today. Uh, we know how busy everyone is, so we appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Um, my name is Tom Ehlers. I'm the president and founder of Method Learning. And as a parent of twins finishing eighth grade, heading into high school this year, uh, so this topic is something I'm interested in on both a personal and a professional level. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists. They come uh, with such a wealth of experience. So first of all, Dr. Tim Poynton was recognized in 2011 as the Counselor Educator of the Year by the American School Counselor Association. Currently, he is a professor in the Department of Counseling and School Psychology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So Dr. Point is committed to improving the transition from high school into young adulthood through his research and research and teaching. Welcome, Tim. Our second panelist is Dr. Rich Lapin. Dr. Lapin also won the prestigious Counselor Educator of the Year Award from the American School Counselor Association. He's a professor, counselor educator, and psychologist committed to transitioning the profession of school counseling from an ancillary support service to a comprehensive program that's central to the academic, personal development, and social justice diversity mission of every school. Welcome, Rich. Thanks. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Amanda Sturr has worked in education for 20 years as a teacher, school counselor, a counselor educator, and a higher education administrator. She has helped thousands of students um, make the transition from high school to young adulthood. I'm very excited to announce that Dr. Sturk recently joined Method Learning to lead our college and career advising division, and her impact has already been substantial. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you, Tom. So let's jump right in. Our topic today is building college and career knowledge and skills. And I'll turn it over to Amanda to lead us off. And before I do, I'll just mention everybody, because of the size of the webinar, we'll keep everybody muted, of course. But please uh, feel free to uh, ask a question to the chat or the questions feature. All right, Amanda, take it away. All right, well, let's get started. Very excited for everyone to be here today. What I would like to do is just do two quick little polls just to kind of figure who, who's in the room, who are we talking to today? So I'm gonna start those polls here in just a second. So the first poll I would like you to do is I would like you to answer what type of program do you serve? Are you a school counselor? Are you in a TRIO gear up program? Maybe you're an independent educational consultant. Maybe you're an other, a teacher, parent, student, somebody that got on this webinar. So just take a minute and tell us where you're coming from today. Fantastic. Ooh, it looks like it's pretty close, kind of got a three-way tie here almost between school counselor, trios, and others. Fantastic. Well, that is fantastic. As you heard um, Tom talking about, uh, Rich, Tim, and I all come from both sort of a K-12 school counselor role and a higher ed role. So we definitely want to talk to all groups today about the importance of building college and career readiness uh, knowledge and skills. So I'm going to ask just one more quick question. So I'm going to close that one real quick. And the other question I want to know is how many students does your program serve? So are you less than 100, 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, or greater than 1,000? So are you in a big district, small district, big program, small program? Because as we do know, when we are talking about large student numbers, obviously that affects our student programming and how we reach students, parents, and so forth. Wow, again, looks like a pretty even mix, but with about 100 to 500 leading. Wow, very interesting. Fantastic, okay, so it looks like the winner is 100 to 500, um, but still pretty even mix uh, throughout. So so great, again, for you to be here. Let me just shut that down. 
and let's get started. So again, thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Um, Tim, Rich and I started College Unmazed. Um, uh, this is right during COVID and I was looking for an assessment and ran across Tim and Rich's work, some of which Tim will be sharing with us today. And we really just wanted to sort of answer the question on how can we help students navigate the high school to college process. So during COVID, we sat down, we worked, and we started building College on Maze because we knew there needed to be some better resources out there for school counselors, higher ed, trio type programs on how we can actually help our students navigate the process. So one of the things that I think, again, why we do the work that we do, we had some sort of guideposts that we were looking at. And one of the things that we continually looked back was some of the um, information about the, the jobs that are going to be available and are available right now that most, over about 60%, require some type of post-secondary education that could require a certificate, an AA, an AS, a four-year degree, or even higher. And you can see, even though on the chart we're getting better at meeting that 60% need, there still is a gap to what is needed in the workforce. And as we know, as students get more post-secondary education, that it creates a higher economic mobility for them. On average, you know, a four-year degree versus somebody that just has a high school diploma, on average is about a million dollars more in their lifetime. And so when we look at sort of the federal poverty rate, and we look at students who get some type of, and finish some type of post-secondary education, that if we're gonna build a stronger economy and have people have more choices, that they need to have some type of degree or certificate. So those are really two of our kind of guiding factors. However, Tim and Rich, in one of their research studies, found some discrepancies. Tim, do you want to explain the next slide? Sure. So um, Rich and I have been doing research in um, the, the transition from high school to college, focusing on ways that school counselors could intervene in that. Um, school counselors and, and other uh, college access professionals, for example, but really focused on school counselors. So I've um, been doing that probably for about 15 years now. Um, and a few years ago, um, kind of brainstorming and, and we're trying to find out what are some malleable factors? What are some things that are actually relatively easily changeable um, things that school counselors could could work with students on that um, could lead to, to changes, um, positive changes for students in their transition from high school into college in particular, and kind of settled on this notion of college knowledge. Not a, we didn't coin that term. It's not a new idea. There's a gentleman named David Connolly who's been writing about this for about 15 years or so, but um, we searched far and wide for some way of measuring college knowledge and came up empty, essentially. So um, that led to a, a long, relatively arduous process of developing a measure to, to, to assess college knowledge. Um, and in, in the study that we implemented to, to validate it and get some, I shouldn't say validate it, to get some um, reliability and validity evidence for it, um, it we uh, administered it to uh, five or six high schools um, and uh, administered it to students in two grade levels, um, either ninth and 10th grade and graduating seniors in April or May of the senior year, with the idea being we can compare people who have been exposed to the high school's um, college and career programming um, as graduating high school seniors and then measure looking for kind of pseudo pre post test differences. Um, by comparing the graduating high school senior scores to the freshman and sophomore scores, essentially. And that's what, what is depicted in this graph. Is, uh, number one, uh, number one kind of striking finding, I think we'll see it on the next slide, is that of the um, 74, uh, 75 um, or so cake items that exist, the average score on it for a graduating high school senior was about a 50. Um, as we see here, it's 51. 51 for the first, for the not. 51 for the non-first gen students and 38.6 for the others. So it's about a 50. That's a failing grade in most high schools, right? So if you could go back to the other one, Amanda, please appreciate that. Um, so again, these graduating high school seniors who had all already made their college plans had done so um, 
with relatively little college knowledge, essentially. So there's a lot of room for growth. There's a lot of opportunities to improve students' college knowledge. Um, what this graph is showing is on the left-hand side, and it's a little bit hard to see, on the left-hand side is, is the student's scores in ninth and 10th grade. Um, and on the right-hand side is their scores on each of the subtests um, in 12th grade. And, and the subtests are um, the Knowledge College Life subscale and the Admissions Procedure and Financial Aid subscale with the um, Admissions procedures and financial aid is on the bottom and the knowledge of college life is on the top. But anyway, what we're looking at here is the gap over time between ninth and 10th grade and, and 12th grade. Um, and this is what really drives a lot of the work that I do and I know that we do collectively is trying to um, provide more equity in college going for folks. And what we're seeing here is that the gap between first generation and non-first generation students uh, was 5% or 9%, depending on the subscale that you're looking at. And that gap actually grows over time. Um, so the difference between first generation students and continuing generation students increases as students go through high school. And, and this is the troubling part for me is that if schools are, are to be a space to promote equity, um, we're not doing it right now in terms of college knowledge. Uh, so that's something that really motivates a lot of the work that we've done in developing a book to promote college knowledge, um, the, the College Unmazed book, and the work that we're doing with people like you, counselors, um, TRIO program staff, uh, college access workers, et cetera. Um, one of the key things we're trying to do and, and in the presentation today is help you learn about the kinds of knowledge and skills that can really help close that gap that we know exists. Next slide, please. So this is just, again, that same data represented a little bit differently focused on the 12th grade students. Um, we've got the 76 items. It's now 75 items because one of the items related to the SAT uh, no longer applies. So um, that's the full measure. The, there's 42 items essentially that were um, psychometrically valid, if we can use that language, just in the interest of brevity. Um, and then we break down the scores here for the Knowledge College Life subscale and the Admissions Procedure and Financial Aid subscale. So um, one of the things that we learned in looking at all the psychometrics of this assessment was that uh, one of the reasons why a lot of the items didn't qualify in, in the 42 was because not enough students knew what they were. So for example, one of the things I like to harp on is this notion of demonstrated interest. Chances are most of us here know what demonstrated interest is. Um, and know how important it is for schools that consider demonstrated interest, but for a lot of first generation students, they don't know what demonstrated interest is or means, or that uh, you can demonstrate interest in a college by going to visit a college campus. And that maybe if you don't do that, you're disadvantaged. Like that's something that a lot of people don't know. And that's why items like that didn't perform well in our psychometric analysis. So thanks for listening to that. I know this is probably some of the boring researcher stuff that you don't want to hear as much about, but. It underpins a lot of the work that we do. So thank you. Well, and I think it's very important because the idea is if, you know, as practitioners, we are helping our students and we're actually seeing that the gap is increasing versus decreasing between our student populations, there's a problem, right? And so when we looked at, you know, Tim Minrich's research and what they've been doing here, it's like, then how can we scaffold the information so that all students get the information and they are able to be successful both in high school and beyond. So we're going to pass it over to Rich. Rich, so tell us how we took this information and sort of built a plan around it. Well, thanks. So well, thanks for having us, Tom. And I, I did want to say, I think you and I are on opposite sides of the spectrum because about 10 years ago, I had one of the happiest days I've ever had uh, about 2012, and I realized I would have no new college debt uh, accumulating at that point. So I, I have my I have three daughters in their 30s, so we've gone through the community college, the competitive selective college, and as a first generation college student, it's been uh, it's been quite an education, uh, I, I would say. So so let me say um, uh, just a couple of things about this. First, you know, well, think about it, getting ready for college, applying for college, going to college, paying for college, graduating college, and God forbid getting a job after college. That can be a bewildering maze. Now, I have to give Amanda credit for this because the maze was her idea. And I remember the first time I heard it, I said, no, nah, that can't be, that's not right. 
But the more you think about it and the more you dig into it, I, I think it's really true. Obviously, this whole college business, it represents one of the largest financial investments that most families will make in their life, lifetime outside of buying a house. Now, so what we did is we wrote a workbook um, based on a lot of research, in, interdisciplinary research from across the board, uh, from a lot of different theorists. And the workbook was trying to help students and families be more in control of this bewildering process. Um, and the workbook has two parts. The first part, as we're going to talk about today, is college and career readiness. That's we, and we've organized it into four factors, the you factor, the academic factor, the career factor, and the money factor. And the second part of the workbook has to do with making an informed decision. It's really something when you start listening to young people tell you why they're choosing a particular college that, that, that they are, you know, for a hundred or 150 or $200,000 that, you know, that, that's quite a lot to base on that kind of a, of a decision. So we're gonna talk about, and so what we've come up with is an informed decision-making strategy we call LEADS, a higher order thinking strategy. And we're gonna talk about that in two weeks. But I, I think what we want to really get across is this idea. Our book is both transformational and developmental. So part one is really about middle school through 11th grade. So for example, Tom's uh, twins would be a perfect uh, uh, place to begin these first four chapters uh, that, we're, that, we're, that we're gonna talk about. And uh, then part two, the decision-making is sort of the end of 11th grade and certainly then 12th grade as students as, and their families are making decisions about what they're gonna do. So our goal real quickly is to engage every young person in a coherent and connected discussion about education and careers across time so that it's not just a one-off uh, like a, a PowerPoint slide that's disconnected for the next one, that over time you have a series of conversations that then helps the young person to feel that they're known, not another face in the crowd. There's a sense of personal connection there. And if you look at um, a Center for Disease Control, that sense of being known and having a personal relationship is, is the best predictor of both in-school and out-of-school outcomes, as well as if you look at a public agenda study, uh, college-going outcomes as well. So these are very powerful things. And what, we, what we've tried to do is come up with a workbook if a young person will go through it, you go through it with them, that they are going to have this sense of personal connection. Okay, you want to go to the next slide? So, um, the, so the, what we've done is we've organized the first half of the book, and this is our kind of self and college knowledge mind, uh, uh, mind map. And it, and it tries to identify the skills, the essential skills, knowledge, and attitudes that you need to be college and career ready. So we're going to start chapter one is the U factor. We're going to talk about eight, eight strengths uh, that promote uh, resilience, adaptability, and proactivity. Uh, the academic factor, and, and we're going to, and in the first chapter, talk about what the eight strengths are, and the, what are the activities you can do while in high school to promote those eight strengths. And then the second chapter is the academic factor, talking about the programs, grades, testing, but also the information that's out there about what admissions counselors are looking for when they go to about, you know, like uh, what are the academic and non-academic factors that go into the actual admissions decisions on the colleges side of things. Uh, the third chapter is the career factor. We talk about career self-knowledge, the different degrees uh, that, um, uh, that go into, that, that are possible. And then they use the 16 career pathways. And we make a big strong push about, you know, if you think about um, the incredible changes that are going on in the world of work, you know, with artificial intelligence, that's gonna be wiping out jobs, creating new jobs. Uh, it, you know, it, it's really quite a thing. And how we have to be very intentional about helping young people begin to learn about this big wild world of work that they're going to move into. The good news is students are interested in knowing about themselves and their futures. And the last is the money factor. What are the money sources that, uh, uh, you know, that families and students need to be aware of and the money terms, you know, the debt is horrific. And, but there are better ways to go about it than, uh, than just racking up, uh, a, you, know, a, you know, an inordinate amount of money so that you hear, this is where you're hearing young people talk about, uh, they can't buy a house because they have the college loans they're paying back or they can't start a family because of the monthly uh, bills that they're, they're paying attention to. So those are the four things. And what we're trying to say is these are the essential skills and knowledge that really promote college and career readiness. 
Great. And I will say in the handout, you actually have a PDF of this poster. And if you also want, you can see both Tim and I have it behind us. Um, we use these all the time. I use them all the time in working with families and students. And it's so great just to open up and talk about things very succinctly. So if you're looking for a poster, we're happy to get one out to you. But you also have the PDF and feel free to use that uh, within your program. So Rich, I think we're gonna start with the academic factor then, and we're just gonna kind of go through some of the key aspects of each of the chapters. Um, again, really giving you straight out of the workbook, so that way you can see how it's scaffolded and how this information, like uh, Rich says, it needs to be built over time and revisited often. So let's get started in. For those of you that are familiar with comprehensive school counseling programs, it really is central to, to that as well. Absolutely. All right. So as sort of Rich already said, um, what we have, what we looked at when we looked at the research, we looked at what's out there, we looked at comprehensive counseling, we looked at, you know, what makes a successful program. We knew that students had to build very specific college and career knowledge and skills. So not only do they have to know the information, but they also have to internalize it and use that knowledge within their own life. And so one of the things that you will see throughout is we use a case study approach. So we look at a student that would be pre pretty much their same age, their same sort of demographic of the student, and we walk them through how each student can build each of their factors. But central to all of those factors is really the kind of the cornerstone of college and career readiness, which is these essential eight college and career readiness. And Rich, I'm going to have you talk about it. Um, this is a lot of your research that you've done over the years. So can you quickly explain the eight strengths? Thanks. Um, and I'm just going to be very brief here. You know, um, there's obviously a lot of research that's uh, summarized on this one page. But very quickly, young people who become proactive, resilient, and adaptive are more likely to be better prepared to succeed in education, whatever that might be, and the workforce. Proactive young people, um, they are the architects of their life. They're not passive responders. Um, I know a young woman, the first week, the first day she was on her college campus, she went over to the writing center and made the writing center her home. 80% of her grades in that college, there was written work that was, was required. Resilient young people, they can withstand and recover quickly from uh, setbacks and difficult situations. Um, I know a first generation young man of color who got into the management program, but he didn't get into the sports management major. Nobody ever told him college knowledge wise. You don't. You can get into a business school, but that doesn't mean you get into the school of accountancy or you get into these more competitive. So he was having to deal with that kind of a, of a setback. Um, uh, adaptive young people change and grow and seize hold of new opportunities. Uh, one of my daughters actually just got a, a computer science degree online and nearly doubled her uh, income running a website for a museum that she's, that she's working for. Now, in the research, there's a, there's a number of these different uh, factors, if you will, that promote um, uh, uh, the uh, you know that that promote the kinds of things that, that we're talking about, uh, and actually that promote proactivity, resilience, and adaptability. Agency. Uh, we've so what we've done is we've identified eight: agency, finding purpose and direction, positive beliefs that have to do with efficacy, attributions. Uh, Carol Dweck's work about growth mindset, the cognitive behavioral kind of uh, John Crumbolt's kind of uh, uh, beliefs about that. Knowing yourself, that's been a standard in the career development literature since the beginning. Becoming a successful student. Successful students act differently in the performing, planning, and outcome phases of any learning task that they're involved in. Character for workplace success, actually being able to get along with others, be a leader, be flexible, show up on time, show initiative, uh, work as a teammate and college knowledge that Tim was talking about and maybe most importantly of all college support network who's this broad range of, uh, of people who are going to provide you both emotional and instrumental support they're going to be there for you emotionally but they're also going to open doors and show you uh, and we've all if we if you've worked with young people you can identify times that you've been helpful you know both emotionally and instrumentally and how important that is. 
Yeah, and I think I think especially in talking to the practitioners in the room, that college support network, you'll see that throughout that we really promote how do students and, and teach students how to communicate all of this information, right? So as they're going through the high school to college process, leaning in on that college support network so they're able to sort of strengthen those skills and be and use really reflective practice, right? What, what's working for me, what's not working for me, and being able to communicate that with others so they get the support and the help they need. So our eight strengths, I think, are really central to everything that we do. So let me go forward. So in academic factors, so we're kind of moving on to chapter two, we really focus on three different areas because so much, even with COVID, and, and Tim is going to talk about that next, kind of pre-COVID, after COVID, and college admissions and what that looks like, um, but we really see that the courses that students take, academic coursework, so whether it's honors courses, AP, IB, dual enrollment, A's, maybe they're taking a, a CTE, a career technical program, but their academic coursework really is central to building some of these skills, their eight strengths, and also really building what they're interested in and what their values and passions are, especially when we get into career aspects. But we also look at how are you doing in your grades, right? Are you, um, do you have a weighted GPA? What's your unweighted? Uh, what are colleges looking for? And again, Tim's going to talk a little bit more about how that leads into college admissions. And lastly, test scores, you know, and even working with, with method, you know, test scores are still a very central part of a lot of what's going on. So they need to have the reading and the writing and the math scores. So while it might just ACT, SAT, B1 test, having those academic skills to be successful on those tests is going to have them be more successful in their, in their post-secondary education. So all these really together lend to, is a student going to be successful in a post-secondary institution? And so Tim, why don't you lead us a little bit into how this affects college admissions? So thanks. So um, here's a, a slide um, based off data from a NACAC survey, the National Association for College Admission Counseling. Um, before the pandemic, every year they would survey admissions directors from across the country to ask them how important each of these things was to them when they were making admissions decisions. Um, and things stayed relatively similar over time um, up until about, this is based on the data from 2019. So this is the most recently data, the most recent data available. Um, and it shows that what's most important to the average um, director of admissions at, at a college uh, are things that are reflected on your transcript. That's the first three things here. That's grades in all courses. So your overall GPA, essentially your grades in college preparatory courses. And then the strength of curriculum or how rigorous were the courses that you took. Um, the fourth thing there is the admissions test scores. And this is the thing that's going to be different now um, since COVID, since so many places went test optional. Um, I'm curious to see uh, that summarized somewhere um, where they fit in. But the things I want to highlight are, are, are two here. Number one, um, while admission test scores are an important consideration, they've never been the most important consideration in college admissions, um, at least according to the NACAC surveys. Again, that varies from college to college. I'm not diminishing the importance of them in any way, but um, admission test scores with them being optional now that the landscape is a little bit different than what's depicted on, on this graph. The other thing that I like to highlight on here, uh, a couple of other things that I like to highlight on here are things like if you look at the very bottom, the thing that was rated by admissions directors to be the least important are extracurricular activities. Now, how much buzz do you hear among students and parents around the need to be uh, doing all kinds of extracurricular activities and how important that is for college admissions? If we look at it objectively to the admissions directors that, that are surveyed and, and part of NACAC, they're the least important thing among all of these things. The, the other thing I like to talk about is the council recommendation letters. Um, I'm sure we have some counselors on here who spend a lot of time in the fall every year writing recommendation letters. Some schools, they even give the counselors a, a few days off to do writing at home, um, which I think is great. Um, so given that they fall pretty far down on the list, is it worth all the effort that you put in as a counselor in writing these recommendation letters? And the answer I think is 
yes, and it depends. And what it depends on are the kinds of places, all of these things, in fact, um, every single item on here can be the factor that gets a student, a student admitted to a particular college. So all these things can be important to the student who's sitting in front of you. Um, and these are just averages. And that's the other take home message that I want you to have as well. Generally speaking, um, your track record of success as a student in high school is going to be the thing that, that colleges look most closely at. And that makes sense, right? Um, the next thing is if they're considering test scores, that's going to be the next important thing as a more objective measurement of academic um, potential, right? And then the rest of these things are all um, somewhat malleable, more malleable factors that, um, that shed additional light on the student. But any single one of these things can be the thing that leads to a, a successful admissions decision at a particular college. All right. Um, can we flip to the next one? Yeah, great, thanks. So, um, so what we have here essentially is um, the academic and non-academic factors uh, when we're looking at the things that people in admissions consider, it's the academic and non-academic factors. And where these things are actually pulled from is the common data set. If you're familiar with the common data set initiative, um, I don't think we have enough time to go into it too far today, but the common data set initiative, it's not a single thing, but it's a, it's a reporting format that some colleges voluntarily voluntarily participate in that helps them share information with both the public and places like US News and World Report and the College Board. Um, and Peterson's, I, be, I believe, is the other one. So anyway, so this they ask on this common data set reporting form um, about the importance of academic and, and how, how important each of these academic and non-academic factors are, with the academic factors being things like, similar to the NACAC survey, a rigor, your secondary school record, class rank, GPA, uh, test scores, et cetera, um, with the essay being one of the academic factors they consider, and then all the non-academic factors, the extracurricular activities, do they use an interview, um, et cetera. And this paints a, a picture of what you as an applicant or you as a counselor who is advising applicants to these, to these colleges, um, what ostensibly somebody in their admissions office said they consider important more and less important when they're making these admissions decisions and that can help you better advise students so for example um level of ap applicant interest which is also known as demonstrated interest is one of the things that the colleges will report on this common data set form and if you then know that a college considers demonstrated interest and you know a student's applying to there you need to make sure that they're actually actively demonstrating interest in some way shape or form be that by reading the emails that the college sends interacting with the admissions counselor following them on social media doing a campus visit um, etc all of those things are, are different ways to, to demonstrate interest um, but if you don't know that a college is considering it and you don't have for example you don't have the budget to travel to a college that you're really interested in um, and they consider demonstrated interest you might be knocked down a little bit for for not demonstrating interest uh, No, I think that's fantastic. And I think it's just so important when we looked at how to scaffold the knowledge and the skills that it's really important to start talking about this early on in the process. Because if all of a sudden a student has decided to go to college or you know has aspirations, if they don't know what colleges are looking for and they haven't sort of been building those skills, then they're gonna be at a disadvantage when you get to that senior year. So that's why we actually put this much earlier on in the process than I think a lot of programs do. So they're able to understand the work I put in right now is going to pay off later and this is how. So it's kind of that backwards by design. What's my long-term goal? And let's work backwards to make sure that I can actually meet that goal. And so even um, more importantly, is sort of moving on and letting as students kind of go through the process to also think about their long-term goal, but also what do I want to be with my life? <laughs> what do I want to do? I know I keep, you know, I, I won't say my age, but I keep trying to decide what I want to do with my life, right? But I think that this is a hard sometimes conversation to have and Rich, I mean, you have done so much career theory and, and career and research. So explain what the importance of building a career factor is throughout this process. 
Yeah, obviously I'm biased. I'm going to say it's critically important. Um, I, I'll throw one stick to, uh, um, I think an IES statistic out that four years after graduating from college, after paying for four or five years of college, four years later, less than half of the students were in a career path, that the, a stabilized career path that they would saw as moving in a long-term direction. Um, I think the, the reasonable, well thought out career programs early on can can do a lot. And what we what we try to get at here is that informed career decision making happens at the intersection between self knowledge and occupational knowledge. And that's been a fundamental uh, foundation of the vocational and career guidance movement in the United School Counseling Movement for, for, for a long time. And if you uh, go to the next slide, I want to be careful about our time here too. So um, just moving through. Um, and so in the workbook, we use uh, cases and examples all the way through. And this is a, a young man. And, and what we're showing is the, the intersection between self-knowledge and occupational knowledge. We have a way of uh, helping students then assess and identify what, what's uh, commonly called their Holland Code. His would be investigative realistic and social so it's scientific and mechanical and teaching abilities he likes using scientific methods working with tools but he also likes to help others and what we try to really highlight and this is the importance of work values so in addition to liking to build things and solve uh, technical things. He also, this is a young man who likes to help others uh, as part of that. And then well, if you look at the occupational knowledge, you might say, well, what can someone, well, what, what occupational knowledge can you gather in high school? I'd say quite a lot. So he's in, he's taking STEM coursework. He's in school clubs that relate back to this. He's got a part-time job. He works around the house. He volunteers uh, and he, he interacts with his college support network. Uh, and um, and actually, and in the case we said how he's, he's He's learned something, his mom's got an illness. And so from all of that comes around a focus on, we, we teach the students about the 16 career, career pathways. So health science, uh, and then the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math. But my biomechanical engineering then stands out for him as a way of taking who he understands himself to be and also what's available in the world of work and then beginning to hone in on that general kind of pathway uh, and when, he's, when he's beginning to consider uh, uh, how to pick high school classes and then think about longer term plans. We have several different exercises and activities in the workbook that get you get get students to be able to do just this absolutely because if again if, if you have a long-term goal if they're able to see what they can do right now and how they can start exploring hopefully we don't have the 50 percent that regret their major and are in you know the career path that they want it to be in that if we can give them sort of that occupational knowledge and more insight on their self-knowledge so in your programming really focusing on both but letting that students know at that intersection is where it's the most impactful right gives the most sort of effort um, and effectiveness there excellent i know we could talk about career theory and everything all day long couldn't we <laughs> it's hard it's hard we, we could we could probably spend a whole hour just on each of the sections for sure so i know it's a lot of information, but we're just, again, trying to give you an overview on why all these factors are so critical to the process. And as sort of Rich pointed out early on, you know, the 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 topic of student debt is just, it's, it's forefront of everything that you're talking about. And students are really scared and parents are scared. And on the next slide, you're going to see that I do think that there are some myths or misconceptions about that. but one of the things that we follow, this is all from um, the Sally May, and you can actually find this information yourself, um, but they analyze all the, and they have a survey that they do every year. And so what they're finding is, and you can see some of the uh, data that we have here, is 66% of families do say they have a plan, which when we were looking at the 2020 data, that actually went up. I think we were at like 55% a few years ago. So more are kind of trying to tackle that, how are we gonna plan the college? And they also look at though, 88% are saying that higher education is an investment, which is still really high, but it actually went down. I think it was at like 90%, 91% um, the last time we wrote this. And what's interesting is 73% of families do use some type of grants 
or scholarships to help pay for college. So it's an integral part of um, how families do create that plan. Um, but what's interesting is over 30% of families are simply not completing the FAFSA, which we know is a huge part of paying for college. And I just found it interesting, they asked families, why did they not file the FAFSA? And a lot came back saying that they believe their income was too high, maybe that the application was too complicated. We know it's gonna be really interesting this year with the new FAFSA um, form. And 13% did not know about the FAFSA. So again, when Tim was talking about sort of that deficit and that gap, when, you know, 13%, so over one in 10 are saying they don't even know that the FAFSA exists, that's, that's an issue, right? And that's something that we need to definitely discuss. So when we're looking at the discussion around paying for college or any post-secondary education, a lot of times in our program, we put it very far into the future. We put it into senior year. Let's get applied. Let's see what institutions give us and let's kind of deal with it later. We really believe that in your programming, you should consider talking about the money factor as early and as often as possible and actually actively going through the process of the multiple different ways of paying for college. So primarily one of the things that we believe students, all students should know from the get go is that the cost of attendance, so the sticker price of a college, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but that total cost of attendance at 70,000 or the 30,000 that they're seeing is not what most families pay. In actuality, nine, and nine out of 10 families do not pay the total cost of attendance. Most, nine out of 10, pay the net price. So that is when um, you know, we reduce our federal gift aid, we reduce our state gift aid, maybe some athletic scholarships, other gift aid from external sources, institutional gift aid programs. When we reduce all of that by what's gonna be coming to us, college is much more affordable. And I do think that we need to, as um, practitioners, really be talking about affordability. I am, I, for the last eight years, I was at a community college and I was running a student uh, focus group of high school students and we were talking about affordability. And I said, how much do you think college costs for like one year? And and these were pretty high achieving students that we were uh, discussing, they're talking to, and they came back and they're like 50,000, 60,000, 20,000, you know, these high, high numbers. Our community college was on average $3,500 for a year. And so they really had inflated numbers. And so, you know, we really believe that college is accessible for all students whether you go through a career technical program, whether you go through a community college and do a two plus two program, but that we need to have the discussion and early with our students and our families that college can be affordable, but we need to plan for it early. We need to understand what, where our sources of money can come from and how can we tap into that even before senior year. So they're really going to understand the true cost of attendance. So that's just a really key thing, I think, for us. One of the things that we do, um, I was working with a senior and he was gonna go out of state to Colorado. If you know anything about Colorado, <laughs> no one pays in state or no one, it, you're, you're basically paying full price. And so um, I said, go back to chapter four. And at the end, there's at home discussions where go through each of those questions and talk about how are you gonna pay for college? Is the student responsible for this? How much can the parents actually afford? And it's really shocking. I'm sure Tim and Rich, you would agree. It's shocking how many families don't have that discussion about who's really gonna pay for college. Are we taking loans? Are we not? What does that look like? And I know we're gonna talk about it in the next uh, webinar when we talk about leads, but it's why one of the last activities we do in the workbook is actually have them make a financial plan and write out exactly who's paying for what, what does that look like, how do I not lose my scholarships, and, and so forth. But starting the conversation early is really critical. So that sort of leads us to, Rich, you, were, you mentioned this, and um, I'm gonna let you 
kind of explain a little bit more about the counselor connectedness, counselor student connectedness scale. Well, I'm a little concerned about the time. I don't want to like be concerned about other people's time, but essentially we have a free download for you at our, at our um, on our website if you come and and really take a look at. Um, uh, it, it'll give you a, a way of estimating, uh, measuring how uh, whether or not a student feels like uh, they're just another face in the crowd or if they're personally known. That gets at the whole idea about uh, personal connectedness and how important that is. And um, what the, what we can show you if you're interested is some research that in in schools where there are better ratios of counselors to students, what you find is students are are more likely to say, no, there's someone in there who knows me. Like, I kind of I feel wanted. I feel like I belong as opposed to, you know, I'm just there and nobody really pays much attention to me. It, it, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of research that would connect those kinds of feelings to uh, successful outcomes. Fantastic. Thank you. No, and that's an easy uh, download and we can get that to you as well. It's just a little, like he, uh, Rich said, just a little four question survey that you can ask your students to see how connected they are to your program. And so that kind of takes us to, um, we alluded to next time, we are going to be discussing uh, specifically the lead strategy. So that's really the junior senior strategy on going through the college application process and the decision making process, which I think is, you know, a lot of us practitioners, we are very good at kind of teaching students how to maybe build a list, maybe even exploring colleges and even that applying those are very transactional items and steps and so what we do is we really increase that thinking to more of a transformational so how can we move on from just you know this is where i'm applying to really making an informed college decision so we're going to be talking about leads and and that process um, in two weeks so there is a qr code so if you have not yet signed up for that, go ahead and, and take a picture of that and get signed up. I'm sure Method will also send that out um, with the recording as well. And I will show you, if you like the first mind map, we love our mind maps, um, the second mind map of leads looks like this. It's actually, if you get a poster, it's a, it's a front and a back. But this is what we're going to be talking about next time. Build a list, explore, apply how to make a decision, and then also how to make a plan to succeed. So a lot of you might be thinking sort of what's next? Maybe you think, you know, how can I use this in my school or, you know, trio gear up program that I'm already using and maybe have further questions. And, you know, one of the things having, you know, having worked in higher ed, having been counselor educators, having been uh, school counselors, both Tim and I were school counselors, you know, I had, I was one to 400 and I was the only school counselor in the school. So I had to do it all nine through 12. I had to help with applications. And so that's actually what started College Amaze because I'm like, a lot of the conversations that I was having, I was saying to every student that came in, if Rich came in, I would have the same conversation. How do I get scholarships? Do this, Rich. Tim would come in, how do I do an application? This is, so I thought if we could sort of flip the script and we can give them that transactional information through, you know, a curriculum, when we came and they came into my office, how could I then have a transformational conversation? And what I found is when I started using this program with my own students, we went from about, uh, there's about $300,000 worth of scholarships. We had about 100 seniors to over $10 million worth of scholarships. And we also doubled our, uh, where we applied to and our acceptance rates as well. So it was really phenomenal what our students were doing because they were able to do that sort of transactional on their own time. And then I could really help them with sort of the fun part when they came in. And so not only is there a student workbook, but there's a whole curriculum that goes with it with PowerPoints, there's um, principles, there's posters, there's a USB with all the lesson plans, um, there's cards, you get like a whole box, uh, which is really fantastic. So there's a lot of information to help you teach it. 
And then as well, uh, Tim and Rich and I do go out to schools and help with professional development, whether it's a school-wide approach or uh, maybe it's just to help with the school counselors or U.S. practitioners in the higher ed trio programs. But we can really meet those needs, you know, along with sort of method and the academic side. Now we're really bringing in that sort of college and career readiness and creating a much more comprehensive program to help your students through. Uh, so Kyle has his email is up there. He is our point of contact for method if you're interested. And if you do complete the uh, form, the QR code, um, there's gonna be a 20% off um, in the next week if you do fill out that form and contact Kyle if you have any questions. So let's open up. I know we have just a few minutes here. Um, so let's say if there's any questions from the audience. All right. So I see it looks like Kyle is answering some questions. Yes, we can send you a recorded copy or a recorded copy of the webinar. Um, I think Candace did ask a question. Maybe you saw it. It asked about how much the workbook is. It is a consumable workbook. It's $35 uh, per student uh, workbook. And like I said, the curriculum, depending on how many you purchase, the curriculum can go along with that as well. Any other questions? I'm just watching the chat. No? All right, Renee had a really good question. She asked, is this good for middle school? Absolutely, I would think it would be definitely better for um, maybe second semester, seventh grade or early eight or eighth grade. I probably wouldn't do sixth grade. The nice thing is this, this book would grow with a student. So if like they're not all going to be able to hit up the leads process because it's actually an actionable step. But I know my daughter's in 10th grade and she's already read the entire book because she wants to be prepared. So it's going to be one of those workbooks that you could definitely work on earlier and then come back to. Um, we do know that things change. And the nice thing is that we are um, our own printer. So when things do change, everything that gets landed to you is the most up-to-date version that we have because we're able to um, print in small batches and you're able to, to have that. So you don't have to wait or anything like that. Uh, so really great question. Robert asked, um, can it be used in workshops or are they individualized? So you would want each student to have their own workbook, but I know I present a lot of this as workshops. So maybe to parents or students, um, one hour blocks. And then when students come in, I can work on their sort of essays and their their activities more on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but you really don't want a classroom set because they do need to, it's a consumable, you do need to work within the book. You're welcome, Renee. Thank you. How many weeks um, of meetings with students to cover all this information? Tim, what would you say? How many weeks? I mean, it could take you four years. <laughs> So in the curriculum, we've got, I believe it's 35 lessons. More than that, I think it's 42. Oh, um, so, uh, but the idea being it's, so I think that we have enough content that you could probably spend as much time as you have available to work with students in a classroom setting, at least most people. Um, but um, it, it can be designed to be done um, starting in the junior year, essentially in spring of junior year, if you're in a traditional place, you could do it in a compact format or if you spread it out over, over even late middle school and early high school years, it could, it could work like that as well. Yeah, you can really narrow it down to focus in on different things and spread it out because we really, you know, have uh, designed it to be across the four years. And back to the earlier question about uh, middle school, I couldn't agree more. You know, the best predictor of where you're going to be as a 12th grader is actually where you are as an eighth grader. 
uh, and the very things we're talking about, there's a lot of good research about the kinds of development that's going on at that age that's just critical. So those, those constructs we were talking about, about uh, proactive, resilient, and adaptive, the eight strengths, right on target. So you really can, because one of the things we've heard from counselors is about access to students and having not having large amounts of times and needing to, you know, to find ways so that we really can think about taking the materials and turning it into, you know, 15 minute hard hitting kinds of activities that you can do something, but then you can do it over a period of time. Right, yeah, no, I think having that, I mean, all programs are so different, right? It doesn't matter if you're in a large school, a small school, and how you have access to your students, you know, it, it, it changes. And so we really try to make it as flexible as possible. And that is the nice thing um, I think about the book and the curriculum is whether you want to do in a workshop or sort of a flipped classroom setting. I was at an early college, uh, so my juniors and senior were at the college full time. And so I did a lot of videos on it. And then when they came in is when we talked about the activities. And so that works as well. So lots of different options. So really great questions again um kyle can answer a lot of them and he can actually he has links to show you the entire book as well so well we will end off there for today i really appreciate every appreciate everybody joining us staying on listening um you can reach out if you have any questions about the cake which is the the college admissions knowledge evaluation that Tim was presenting earlier. Uh, we do have links to that. Um, and so we can get that to you as well. Again, if you need the posters or anything like that, just definitely reach out to Kyle and we will uh, get you what you need. So thank you everybody. You guys have a great day and we will see you in two weeks from today on Leads. Thank you. Thank you.